Welcome to Kawazit's Italian Cultural Programs Online. My name is Mark Nichols. It's a pleasure to be here. This is the Italian Cinema Forum for 2020. Over the next few weeks, I'll be presenting short introductions to six films preparing us for our upcoming and usual uh, discussions and debates that we're used to having at Kawazit and preparing for that when we can actually all meet together and uh, join in the fun. Our first film is The Last Emperor, 1987, which was directed by Bernardo Bertolucci, produced by Jeremy Thomas, and starring John Lone, who many of you will know from films such as M. Butterfly. Bertolucci is well known to us, particularly in this space. Those of you who were with the forum last year will remember we looked at The Conformist, but you'll know his other films before the revolution, 1900, perhaps his most infamous film, The Last Tango in Paris, and more recent films like Stealing Beauty and You and Me. Bertolucci died fairly recently. Jeremy Thomas, his producer on this film, his chosen producer on this film, will perhaps be a little less uh, well known to you, but he shouldn't be because he's produced almost 70 uh, well known films. Uh, in addition to this particular film, he also produced um, Merry Christmas, uh, Mr. Lawrence. Uh, he had a role in Rabbit Proof Fence in Australia. And um, more recently, he's uh, produced films uh, and a particular film appearing in this year's Italian film festival, Pinocchio, the most recent version. The Last Emperor was a four year project uh, shot predominantly in China, uh, including a, an epic, uh, some people say 16 week shoot in the Forbidden City itself, uh, it shot also in areas of Northern China and also substantially shot throughout Italy with particular um, work done at Cinecitta Studios in Rome. This film is perhaps the most impactful film for Bertolucci and Thomas who've been, who were working together uh, uh, following this film. It won a, a slew of awards, including I believe nine Academy Awards, which for that time um, pre-Titanic was, uh, quite a significant achievement and certainly um, made Bertolucci and his colleagues um, much better known, I think, to the broader film going uh, community. Bertolucci and Thomas talk about the film as the first Western film shot in China about modern China. And in a sense, it required a great deal of cooperation from Chinese authorities, as you can imagine. Approval was important. Studio facilities in China were very important to the, to the shoot. Um, also, um, the, the particular collaboration of uh, a number of local actors, uh, including one particular actor who is a very high um, official within the uh, Chinese cultural ministry. The film's also notable for its participation of the great actor Peter O'Toole, who plays Johnson, a, a vital role in the film. And the soundtrack attracted particular attention, um, namely uh, uh, Ryuchi Sakamoto coming into the film again, into this particular film. Um, he'd worked with Thomas before. Uh, and of course, the Talking Heads legend, David Byrne, played a very strong role in the, in the sort of three-hander that, that became the um, makeup of the uh, soundtrack of the film, which is almost unforgettable. I've been watching the film a lot lately, of course, preparing for this session, and I cannot get that uh, soundtrack out of my out of my head. Um, as always, the music the music track plays a very strong role in the film, as I think you'll agree um, if you've seen it, and you'll come to get hooked uh, once you've seen it. The plot. And the story of the film is, uh, as you would expect, epic. It deals and begins with uh, the young Pu Yi, who is to become emperor of China, the last emperor of the title, at the, at the moment almost of the, that institution's decline. The film charts Pu Yi's existence as a prisoner in the Forbidden City, 
we, under, we come to understand the cultures of the Forbidden City, the extent to which he is not only a literal prisoner, but he is almost held captive by the denizens of the Forbidden City who are uh, keen to keep the whole thing going, despite what is happening outside China, where governments are falling here and there, and the drive towards the uh, eventual communist takeover uh, and the communist governments in China becomes an issue. And all these things in the first part of the film, uh, we hear about kind of over the fence, if you will. Eventually, uh, the uh, royal family are expelled from the Forbidden City and we chart Puyi's life outside the Forbidden City as he seeks to regain his throne, in a sense. Uh, he becomes a, a, a puppet ruler, in a sense, of northern Manchurian China uh, and uh, very much under the influence of the Japanese. Uh, we see the story there of him, his confrontation with that particular captivity, if you will. And then we also see uh, his um, life after the Second World War, particularly in the 50s, where he uh, is um, imprisoned by the communist authorities. He experiences the, the, the uh, re-education process and, and in, in, um, in China. And we, the film ultimately uh, moves us to the 1960s and, and the end of his life uh, as a gardener in Beijing, uh, leading up to his death in 1967. To call the narrative spread of the film ethic is to undersell it, uh, and this is a fascinating uh, aspect of the film. The historical uh, context is um, thrown up against this character. Um, as I said, a prisoner all his life, and Bertolucci is very much interested in investigating this idea of being a prisoner, being captive, both literally and also psychologically. Bertolucci sees the film very much about change. And in a sense, Pugliere is perhaps a character that goes through very small change, but change which I think is kind of significant. The film's very much about Pugliere as an individual who has a direct um, confrontation with history. And Bertolucci and his colleagues are constantly asserting this idea about the individual up against his, uh, the, the forces of history. And to me, this is one of the key themes of the film. Bernardo Bertolucci is often referred to as the great Freudian Marxist director, and we see all this in The Last Emperor. Bertolucci approaches um, the film with both these lenses. Um, Puyi as emperor and as the subject of the education process is um, a, a moment for Marxist interpretation and Freudian in interpretation. Very typically of Bertolucci's um, interest in Freudian psychoanalysis are certain key ideas about mother, father relationships and also questions of desire and sexuality. And in many ways, the film bears a strong uh, correspondence with um, Bertolucci's earlier film that we've studied in this group, The Conformist of 1970. Equally typical, I think, of Bertolucci's work um, uh, and interest in, 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 in Marxist contexts is the way the film deals head on with questions of social political change and how we as individuals can negotiate that. And he uses Puyi in many ways to be that character, a character that he's pursued in many of his films, most notably in his uh, almost first film in the early 1960s before the revolution, where all of the characters are trying to work out their place in relation to collective notions of society and highly individualistic notions of society. When he came to make The Conformist, Bertolucci said, perhaps I'll make my best film about politics without really talking about politics. And this is an interesting perspective when we think about this film, where politics, social, historical change is unavoidable as a topic. And I think what's going on here is that he's perhaps not 
quite made that journey, but he's highlighting in that, um, well, in the sort of um, messing with that idea of that quote, is that these two things are always in dialectic in Bertolucci's films. Ryuichi Sakamoto makes a really interesting point that Bertolucci either tends to work in, in, in small contexts, we might think of them as his cabinet films, and Last uh, Tango in Paris works like that. And he um, then alternates with films like this film, The Last Emperor, and 1900, these large historical sweeping epic films. And in a sense, this is kind of interesting, a, a subtle interpretation there by Sakamoto, and one that picks up on, I wouldn't say an alternation of these two ideas, but the way the idea of the individual in a, in a, in a, in a small psychological context and the collective dealing with great historical and political change is almost always present in Bertolucci's films, uh, whatever their you know, apparent production scale. But this is a dialectic, a discourse in Bertolucci's films that I think is always there and is very much prominent in the making of and the uh, interpretation of The Last Emperor. What to me stands out with the film is the idea of, and this is an idea that Bertolucci often talks about, is, is, is his drive and desire to make the event happening in front of the camera central to the way the film ultimately shapes up. He talks a lot about this film in relation to questions of what the French critics have called cinema verité what we might think of as documentary issues. When he made uh, Before the Revolution and his early films, Bertolucci seemed to think and, and express the idea that he was making films about life. When he moved to a film like The Conformist, uh, and not just because of the commercial aspects of that film, he started to think that his filmmaking was more about life plus cinema. And I wonder whether with a film like The Last Emperor, we are getting to the point where this sort of formulaic idea of his films is turning into, you know, cinema equals life. Bertolucci um, has talked about the editing processes of his films and the other aspects of pre-production. And he talks about these sometimes as a kind of a restraining, I think he uses the expression police action when dealing with uh, shaping and cultivating the material that he produces in the camera. Bertolucci plays a very, places a very strong emphasis on shooting whatever happens in front of the camera on the day. This, the idea of cinema verite, the idea of an almost documentary, dare we say realism or purity is really important. The idea of turning up and shooting what you see as it happens. Bertolucci is famous for not really using um, very detailed storyboards. He claims that when he shoots his films, he's not particularly thinking about how they're going to be cut up, edited, once he's done his work. Um, working with a, a cinematographer like Storaro, light is everything, and, and Storaro, uh, who nowadays tends to work with Woody Allen, um, light is everything in his films. So the idea of documenting what is going on in front of the camera, whatever the subject and whatever the topic is really, really important. Now you can imagine this is kind of a producer's nightmare. This film was a huge undertaking, four years of work, several months in, in the shooting, uh, the homage scene for the new young emperor alone apparently um, involves something like 1,700 extras who had to sort of literally kowtow to the new young emperor. I mean, this implies the need for um, pre-production, for thorough pre-planning. And that, of course, is Jeremy Thomas's job to get that sort of thing happening. And yet there seems to be an element of truth in the idea that Bertolucci very much did what happened uh, in front of him, that he shot what was going on. And this is a very interesting way of thinking about filmmaking 
because it takes us a long, long way away from the Hollywood notion of filmmaking, everything being pre-planned, everything being pre-conditioned, pre-staged and, 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 and sort of pre-organised to within a, an inch of its own life. Bertolucci talks about this kind of cinema as writing with the camera. It's a very poetic process for Bertolucci. It's not a prosaic one. And all this, in a sense, I think comes to the fore when we're looking at Last Emperor because it tends to work in support of this film as nothing less or nothing more than a kind of a China study project. I'm always fascinated in film ensembles, film companies, uh, filmmaking enterprises coming from one place to a very different place to make a film. And I always tend to think, what are they doing there? What did Bertolucci and his colleagues think they were doing in Beijing, in China, so far removed from their lives in Europe, in Italy and in the United Kingdom? I think we think that a lot in relation to this film because it does appear to be a departure for Bertolucci. Basically, my conclusions to this point, and it would be really interesting to discuss this when we get together, but I see a very strong idea that they were literally there to learn about China. They were there to attempt to understand cultural difference and from analysing the production history and, 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 and the discourse around this production, I think the filmmaking company had a very strong understanding that they knew very little about China and that their um, responses to the environment were going to be highly dominated by their own contexts and their own backgrounds and perspectives. There's a magic moment where Bertolucci talks about the yellow, the imperial yellow uh, that Puyi is supposed to wear. And he goes crazy because apparently it bears some resistance to Parma yellow, which is important for Bertolucci as, as, a, as a man from that part of the world. Um, it's a very um, uh, touristy kind of view, but I think he acknowledges that. And, and, and in a sense, it, it, it represents that kind of uh, the tourist view, which is always going to be a dilemma in this kind of filmmaking. What they did to counteract this was rely very strongly on local knowledge and, and engagement with uh, local um, people and institutions. That, and and they, 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 the basic discussion about the film uh, in production was that they spent a great deal of time doing what we might think of as, on, as street research, um, trying to understand situations and making changes to a script that ostensibly was uh, knocked up before they ever left Europe. This is an interesting notion of filmmaking that we see with this film. It's not so much about the idea of a filmmaker or filmmakers being expert in their subject and then laying it out for us who know nothing. This is filmmaking about trying to acquire knowledge. I think we have a tendency always to think that filmmakers only tell us about their own lives things they know a great deal about. And I think in a sense, that's often very true. But I also think we need to understand the impulse of creative artists to go and apply their particular lens, their frameworks, their focuses on things they know nothing about. And that to me is very much what's going on in this film. So this is very much a filmmaking event and it's creative practice history uh, is attempting to find some sort of truths on the ground, uh, truths about itself, its own processes and its own histories. In many ways, this is filmmaking about filmmaking. Whether that's art for art's sake, you need to make up your own mind. Uh, but in, in many ways, these practices of producing a film in a location which is strange, which is foreign, really, I think, can tell us very much about all sorts of events, all sorts of truths, all notions of history and plenty of notions about politics, particularly in relation to the subjects they seek to shoot. And so I think in a way, this is very much what Bertolucci 
and his colleagues were trying to achieve in China in the middle of the 1980s. That's all I've got to say about this week's film. Please do join us next week or next time for our uh, second film that we'll be discussing, which is Nanni Moretti's much loved film, Aprile, uh, April, uh, which deals with um, Berlusconi Mark I and his um, very Bertoluccian idea of the encounter between the individual and um, the state, uh, the process of history, the process of politics. So picking up on many of our themes from this week, it's also a film about um, Nanni Moretti's character becoming a father for the first time. I'm pretty sure I saw this particular film about a week after my eldest son was born. So it has a particular re resonance for me in that kind of context. But please join us for that session, which we'll be um, posting very soon. Meanwhile, stay safe, stay distance, and above all, get a nice glass of Southern Italian red, sit down on the couch and watch and enjoy and engage with The Last Emperor. <laughs>